Thank you very, very much for a wonderful address. Thank you. And there will be a formal vote of thanks shortly. But Manal has very kindly agreed to answer questions. Uh, I'll just let everybody know that this uh, session is being recorded. Uh, Big Ideas uh, ABC have um, asked if we could video it, and we've, we're doing that. But just to let you know. Uh, but we would very much welcome your questions, and we have roving microphones. Uh, I think we've had a very challenging address, and I'm glad to see there's already a hand up, I think. The young lady with the lovely scarf on. <laughs> uh, thanks for the wonderful speech, Manal. Thank you. Um, I just I have a question. Uh, my name is Lucky. I'm the co-director of Muslim Girls Collective South Australia, uh, a group that's run by Muslim girls, for Muslim girls, and also refugee girls to help empower them. Uh, as a Somali woman uh, coming from a failed state, my question is: How can if women are, I guess, the key to getting a, a, a structural stability in countries? How can women be integral in, how can, what can women do and what can friends of women around the world do to help women in countries such as Somalia to try and get some peace and stability in that country and, and countries similar to Somalia? Thank you. Thank you, it's a, it's a great question, thank you. Um, it's, it's going back to the idea of a parallel approach for you know, women in failed or weak states. And, and you know, incidentally, all um, research shows that helping weak and failed states is much more effective than trying to respond to a state that becomes a transitioning. So it's very important that we're addressing and the element of prevention is introduced rather than consistently being reactive and responsive. So you know, one of the most important things is the parallel approach, which is really helping women in their day-to-day, -day, meeting the basic necessities, addressing issues um, that they, they need to survive, and then opening it up so that they can then integrate into the political process. And there are tons of very powerful um, organizations in Somalia that address women's issues you know, very grassroots, again, working towards not only women's issues, but targeting the youth. A lot of times, one of the problem, and I think this is a role that e everyone in this room can play, which is kind of a little bit of donor education. A lot of time, donors look for NGOs that look like them in the terms of speaking English and being able to respond to report writing and having computer skills. The most powerful women's organizations do not fit that. They are people who have, you know, a lot of them are illiterate, a lot of them have informal connections to the community, but they're organized and they're responsive. So it's important that we find ways to support these grassroots organizations alongside with some of the more elite organizations who tend to be the favorites of international community, but getting in a little bit deeper. The other issue is, you know, particularly for countries that are under dictatorship or under failed states, most often they're cut off from the world. And you know, very little access, if they have internet, very little access on the internet. It, you know, even if it's available, and many times it's not available, they don't have electricity. So whatever can be done where they're hearing from people internationally really provides incredible moral support. The organization I worked for previously, which was Women for Women, had a sponsorship program. And you send in money to support women, but you also send in letters. And I cannot tell you how exciting it was for the women when they would receive letters. It was their only connection in many times to the outside world. And one of the things that we do in the United States is something called twinning, where cities will adopt a city overseas. So for example, Denver adopted a city in southern Iraq called, called Hela, and they would send letters in between, and you, know, you just got an exchange. At one point, they raised enough money where they were able to bring people from Iraq to visit Denver, and vice versa. You know, the goal, it hasn't happened yet, is to come visit Iraq. So you have this exchange between cities, and something that's happened a lot in high schools in the United States is twinning of schools. So a school will adopt a school overseas. And that exchange is extremely important. It really connects them to the outside world and gives people a hope and an understanding that things can be different. And, you know, we saw it in the Middle East in terms of how the movement began to spread from Tunisia to Egypt onward. It was that ability to break this wall of fear you know, at a time, I never thought in my lifetime I would witness it. So what about people who are living in that environment? So being able to really paint that picture is also very, very powerful. We have had a sister city program in the past. I don't think we've had any sister cities in the Middle East. But I reckon everyone here might just ask if we can have one. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs>
Now, we've got time for more questions, so if I can see some hands. Uh, there's a lady, I think, right up the back. Thank you. Thank you very much. You talked about the difficulty of convincing authorities that the problems of women need to be uh, considered when one is planning reconstruction. But it seems to me that is a worldwide problem. It's not just in countries uh, <laughs> that are undergoing reconstruction or development. It occurs in the most developed countries. Um, you know, the problem of uh, women in a particular area, oh, well, that can wait until we fix this up. We've got to fix up the mental health problem. Mm -hmm. We've got to fix up the disabled problem. We've got to fix up the refugee problem. There's always a problem which is more important and women are pushed to the background. Um, do you have a recipe for... <laughs> Preventing this low priority being given to women's issues right throughout the world, uh -huh. whatever the culture and degree of development. Um, well, two things. One thing is that these nations, there's more at stake. And I think a lot of us wish that we could travel back in time when our constitutions were being developed. And, and you know, I know at least for the U.S. Constitution, not only for women, but for a lot of other issues, there were huge gaps on human rights. And you know, wish we could travel back in time. But for these nations, they're at that point of time in their history where they're drafting new constitutions. And so to protect women through the rule of law, again, if that window closes, then they find themselves in our position where we're having to really go through suffrage movements and talk about amendments, which can be a legal nightmare. So it's why it's so important. And I don't know if I have a recipe, but I do think I have a tool. And it's what's in your hand and what's kind of hanging over here on my lapel, which is the microphone. And really making sure that we're out there, that we don't go away, that we're insistent, that we're continuously fighting, not only for our own rights, but for people globally, that they have a place at the negotiating table. Because without that pressure, it's not going to happen. And part of that talking in the microphone is making sure that we learn to talk other people's language. And I know it was a big challenge for me, which was I had to learn to talk in a language where the military would actually listen to me. And you know, I, I was like a fly for them, trying through trial and error, um, here's this issue, here's this issue. And it became very clear that if I wasn't speaking in the language of security, they wanted nothing to do with me. So I had to learn and use the organization Inclusive Security, which highlights, and, and obviously using the greatest tool of all, which is UN Resolution 1325, but really pushing and pushing and saying, this is smart, this is strategic. In many ways, we have to do that with the private and corporate sector. We have to do that, you know, is just learn the different languages so people will see encompassing interests. And really teaching our young women and our young men, you're not doing women a favor. You're being smart, you're being strategic, this is what has to be done, otherwise you're not gonna be effective. So the more we can really deliver that message, hold our governments accountable, I think that's really the next phase for where we need to be. If you look at the last 100 years, we're now part of the debate, we're now part of the agenda. Now we need to be pushing the UN to develop very tangible indicators so things can be measured. We're not gonna be okay with just rhetoric, we wanna see reality, we wanna things, things put in practice, and I think that you know, we should celebrate where we've come, but we now need to talk about action. When will we see tangible differences? And I'm of the viewpoint, it's probably because I'm an economist by training, that if things can't be measured, they're not gonna be done. So we need to really be part of the debate on developing indicators and getting things uh, measured, and then holding our governments accountable, because the UN is basically our governments and the membership of our government, so holding our governments as citizens accountable to meet those indicators. It's rather dim looking back there, but as soon as I heard the voice of the questioner, I knew that it was Anne Levy. <laughs> and Anne Levy is a former state minister for the status of women. And, Thank you, Anne. And, highly, <laughs> and, and has been highly active in fighting for women's rights, probably for most of her life, I would say. <laughs> Thank you. So I'd just like to acknowledge Anne. Thank you. Um, <laughs>